My name's Tim. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm going to be talking about structs, traits, and zero cost abstractions. So this is going to be sort of an introductory talk, I'm, but I'm going to assume that you have a fair bit of programming experience. So you, you should have worked with a few other languages before. Um, but I'm assuming you're, you're fairly new to Rust. So just to talk a little bit about my perspective on Rust. Um, so I'm a, uh, a software developer, but I'm also primarily a security engineer. So I care a lot about security and correctness and making sure the code works properly. Uh, in particular, I focused on cryptography and encryption. So that's sort of how I, I, I view Rust, right? That's, that's the sort of stuff I want to do with Rust. Um, so for me, Rust actually works really well because it prioritizes things that I also care about. So for instance, um, I want to write high performance code because if encryption is slow, then people won't use it. So Rust does some stuff around performance um, where it makes the performance costs really explicit. It, it, they made a lot of design decisions that basically force you to write faster code or it'll make you uncomfortable at least if you don't write faster code. So sometimes that's annoying. Sometimes it gets in the way because you don't really care about performance. But if you do care about performance, then it's very helpful that it nudges you in the right direction. All right, so I, I really appreciate that. Another thing about Rust that's interesting is that it prioritizes code quality. So generally, it, it sort of nudges you away from writing bugs. Now, again, that's something that you might not appreciate if you're trying to just build a prototype really quickly. But if you do care about code quality and getting things to be correct, then that's actually very useful. Lastly, uh, Rust is a... It, it feels a lot like a high-level language, even though you get a lot of low-level control, which is, is very nice. Basically, they, they use uh, traits and abstractions to give you a lot of expressive power in the language, which is very impressive. So in this talk, I'm going to be talking about primarily two things, structs and traits. But in particular, I'm going to talk about the performance aspects. So where there's overhead, where there's no overhead, and the performance trade-offs that, that can occur. So I'm going to be using this term a lot, uh, zero cost abstractions. And you can tell that Rust cares a lot about this because if you look at their home page, the first item in the features list is <laughs> zero cost abstractions. So obviously the community really values this, this feature. So what this means, zero cost abstraction, is that you can add some structure to your code. You can add these new concepts or an abstraction, but at runtime, there's no actual performance hit. There's no overhead to doing so. So I'm going to be talking about this a lot, but it's, it's a very useful concept if you care about performance, but you also care about having nice, readable, quality code. So, okay, first of all, we're going to talk about structs. So I, I hope this is fairly self-evident <laughs> to everybody here, um, but basically we have a, a struct we're defining called point 2D, and it's going to have uh, two fields in it, X and Y, and F64 is Rust's 64-bit uh, floating point value. So I hope that's, that's obvious to everybody here. Um, so just quickly, we can look at some syntax. So if you want to create an instance, we have point 2D, we have a syntax for that. Uh, we're specifying a value for X and a value for Y, and then we're accessing the field, so dot X dot Y. Easy enough, all right. So let's add some methods. So we'll use, in Rust, you use an impl block to add methods to a struct. So we say impl point 2D, now we can add a method. Uh, this is sort of a contrived example, but we'll have a method called move right. So this will move this point to the right by adding to the X value. Uh, one note, if you haven't looked at Rust before, um, Rust has this, this thing called an, an implicit return statement. So the last statement in a function body automatically is re returned, assuming there's no semicolon. So in this, this example, there's implicitly a return keyword before point 2D, just, just to be aware of that. It's kind of weird, but you get used to it. All right, so now we can look at an example of using this, this move right method. So we create a point called P1, we specify a value for X and a value for Y, and then we can call P1.move right, so we get a new point back, point 2, P2, and then we access p2.x and return that. All right, so now the question is, is this code fast? So we're talking about point 2D, we have all of these structs being passed around and stuff, but is this fast? So when we can, we can tell if it's fast is we can look at the actual executable that's produced by compiler and look at the machine code that was generated. So if we do that, then we see, well, it's actually very simple. It just, it loads some constant value and then it returns that constant value. And it turns out that, yeah, that constant is exactly what you'd expect, actually. Because if you look at our code, oh, yeah, right, we're just adding 2 plus 3 is 5. So <laughs> it makes a lot of sense that we just always return 5. So the compiler saw through all the stuff we were talking about with structs and, and point 2D and stuff. It cut that all out, eliminated it by, by optimizing. So, okay, let's make this a little bit more interesting, because that's kind of boring, just always return 5. So we'll add a, an input here. We'll add a, a function argument called input. And instead of moving right by two every time, we'll move right by input. 
Okay, so I want to show you a little bit about what kind of optimizations the compiler can do. So this is not going to be perfectly technically accurate because the compilation process is very complicated, has a lot of stages, a lot of passes. I can't talk about all that. But I can give you sort of a, a decent mental model, at least, to appreciate what sort of things the compiler can do for you. So the first thing a compiler can do is it can look at this method call here. We have move right. And it can say, well, move right is actually a very short method. Right? There, isn't, there isn't much going on in move right. So how about we just copy all the code from move right into this function? So if we do that, now we no longer have to do a method call. Right? So that saves a little, a little piece of work there. And also we can do further optimizations now. So at this point we can realize, well, we don't actually need to, we're not passing around structs here. All this talk, talk about point 2D is contained within this one function. So how about we just break up the structs into their fields? All right, so now we break up into the X and Y components of all the, the point 2Ds, and we no longer have this point 2D concept anymore in this function. We've just optimized that away. So we're talking exclusively in terms of F64s now. So we can keep going, and we can say, okay, we can remove these unused variables. All right, so the Y values don't actually matter for this computation because the X is what we're returning. So we don't care about the Y values, throw them away. And then we can keep going, we can simplify a little bit, and we end up with just three plus the input. Okay, so that's a pretty simple, simple function, actually. And of course, if we look at the actual generated machine code, sure enough, it's loading a constant, which is three, and then it's adding it to the first function argument, which was our input, and then returning. So the compiler was able to see through all that complexity around point 2D. So this is sort of getting at this concept of a zero cost abstraction. This is a case where we have this, this structure called point 2D and this concept in this vocabulary. We have vocabulary like move right. And we're able to make our code more elegant and more descriptive. But then the compiler is able to see through all that complexity and reduce it down to something very simple, just three plus the input value. So these two pieces of code are, are equivalent in the compiler's eyes. So OK, that's, that's one sort of thing we can do with a zero cost abstraction. But there are other things we can do too. So I want to in introduce another example called append-only vectors. And basically the idea here is that in your code, you often have these invariants. So you'll have certain conditions, certain rules that your code follows, but that are often kind of implicit. If you're lucky, then somebody will actually document them and write comments saying, okay, we follow this rule. Like maybe this array should have between three and five elements or something like that, right? All these implicit rules in your code, but still it's easy to break them accidentally or just not read the comments, not realize what you're supposed to do if you're editing someone else's code. That sort of idea. So with zero cost abstractions, what we can do is we can create a new type, some sort of like a structure, a struct or a trait, and we can define those invariants in that type and enforce them. And the compiler will help us by catching mistakes. So we're going to be looking at append only vec. So the idea here is that you're passing around some sort of vector. A vec, just a, for context, a vec is like a list or an array if you're not coming from Rust. Um, so we're passing around a vec, and let's say you're passing it from function to function, and all these functions are supposed to just add things to the vector. They're not supposed to remove things, they're not supposed to look at things earlier on in the list, they're just supposed to add things to the end. So maybe, okay, we add a bunch of things to the vector, and then the, finally at the very end of the computation, we say, okay, we'll use this list and we'll render it in a UI or something like that, right? It's a fairly common use case. So we can actually enforce that invariant and prevent any of those functions from tampering with the earlier parts of the vector. So here's what we'll do. So we'll create a wrapper struct. Um, so basically just a struct with one field in it. And we'll call it append only vec. There's a little bit of generics in this code, uh, but it's, it's maybe very basic. So this is just saying append only vec contains elements of type t, which where t is just generic, could be anything. Um, and then inside, we're going to have a plain vector, vec t, which is similarly going to have elements of type t. So OK, well, we can add some, some methods to this. Again, a little bit of generics there, but nothing, nothing fancy here. Um, so we'll add a, a method, we'll have a constructor. In, in Rust, we call our constructors new, just by convention. So the new constructor will take a plain vector and then construct an append-only vector from that. Next, we'll have a push method. So this is the just like in JavaScript, you push onto an array to add something to the end. Uh, and finally, we'll have into vec. So into vec is the method that takes an append-only vector and returns the original vector so that you can actually do stuff with it. So that's it. That's this is an entirely complete implementation of append only vec. And if we use this type, now we if, if we provide it to a function, that function can only do one thing to it. It can just push elements onto it. Right? Unless now there are ways to get around this, so you can't use this, you can't rely on this for security purposes, but it 
catches accidents at least. So, okay, let's look at an example of using this type. So we have a depend only vac, we've implemented that. So here's some code that might use it. So let's let's pretend you're writing some sort of parser, right? So you're you're parsing some some kind of document, maybe an HTML document or whatever. And you can imagine that you're parsing this large structure, and there, you could run into errors at different parts of the structure. So ideally, what we want to do is you want to collect a list of those errors and then put them all into this one vector. And at the end, you can show them in the UI or present them to the, the programmer or whatever. So here we have some code that we create a plain vector that's empty, and then we wrap it inside an append-only vector, so that way it's protected. We're enforcing this invariant. We call that parsing errors. And then we pass a mutable reference to parsing errors to the parse document function. OK, so you, then we can look at the parse document function. So here I've highlighted the two relevant parts here. But you can imagine this might be a very complicated function, right? Might have lots of code going on. So first of all, we accept a parsing errors as a parameter to this function. And we require a mutable reference so that we can change it. And then second of all, the second box, we have parsing errors.push. So we're pushing on an error message onto this vector. And of course, that's the only thing we can do with it, right? That's the only thing we're allowed to do with it because we have no other methods to find. So you can imagine, here, here's a bunch of stuff we can't do with this, with parsing errors. We can't look at elements. We can't look at the first element. We can't look at the second element. We can't remove elements because there's no remove method. We haven't defined a remove method on append only vec. And lastly, and most interestingly, we can't actually use into vec either. We can't get back the original vector. And this is sort of subtle if you don't know Rust, but it's because we only have a reference to append only vec in this example code in parse documents. If what we need in order to use into vec is we need ownership, and we don't have that here because of how we defined uh, into vec in this function. So anyway, that's that's sort of the, the the larger idea there. So the recipe here is you identify some sort of invariant like append only, and then you create a new type in order to enforce that invariant. So you you define a whitelist of what methods you want to allow access to. So and then if you actually use that type, then you get compiler time errors if you break the invariant. So that's kind of, kind of nice, kind of useful, right? So now, of course, the important question here, if you care about performance, well, is this zero cost? Is there performance overhead to wrapping it in this, this new struct, right? So you could consider these two examples here. So on the top, we have a plain vector, right, which is how you normally write this code. On the bottom, we have an append-only vector. And the question is, well, is there overhead to using append-only vector? And it turns out the answer is, well, we can look at the machine code. And these are the same, which you'll have to trust me on that. But they are identical byte for byte. So if you look at the generated executable files, they matched exactly. So yeah, it's a zero cost abstraction. There's no cost to doing this in terms of runtime performance. All right, so that's the first half of my talk. Um, so now I want to introduce traits. So first of all, let's start with an example here. So let's say we're trying to build some sort of logging mechanism in an application. So this comes up for pretty much any moderately complex application. And if you've ever done this before, then you, you go down this sort of rabbit hole of complexity, right? You, you want to have configuration for your logging. You want to be able to do more logging in, in development and less logging in production, maybe. Except sometimes when you really want more logging in production, but then you want to turn on for a specific component, not other components. So you want to be able to configure component by component in the application. It just gets really complicated, right? So the question is, how, how would we structure this in Rust? How do we structure this so that we can change things elegantly? So the first take would be, well, how would we have a logger struct, right? We have some sort of logger type. We have maybe some fields in that struct that define where, where we're writing to a file or whatever. And then we could have these four methods. We could have error, warn, info, and debug. So this would allow us to say, OK, we want to log something at a, at a debug level of detail, or we want to log something at just like a warning level of detail. So that's a, that's a fairly common approach. The issue, though, is that it would be nice if we could have different implementations of these functions. Right? It would be nice if we could have a different way of, of logging things depending on what type of logger we're using. So this is, of course, we, we can imagine having a, a file logger, like a print logger, a null logger maybe would just do nothing at all, wouldn't do any logging, or maybe like an external service logger, something, something over the network, et cetera. So how about this? How would we use a logger trait? So a trait is basically like if you're coming from Java, it's like an interface. Um, but a trait is where you define a series of, of methods, and you define the method signatures, but you don't define the actual implementation of the methods. So now that we have this trait called logger, then we can have a new type called print logger, which is a specific type of logger, right? So we can implement logger for print logger, which, which is saying we're implementing the logger trait for the struct print logger, and then we provide implementations of these methods. 
And we can do the same thing with like null loggers so and all will be pretty boring, but basically you just have these empty implementations of these methods to show that it's doing nothing. All right, so now we can we can use this trait and we can write functions or encode that's like this log example here that requires a logger type, but it doesn't say what type of logger it requires. So here we're using the info method on this logger, but we don't actually know what type of logger we have. It could be a null logger, it could be a print logger, it could be whatever. So the question is, how does this work? How does it actually, how, how does this implement in the compiler? So the way this work, works in Rust is that the reference to logger is a trait object. It's called a trait object. So a trait object has two things in it. First of all, it has a pointer to the underlying type. So a pointer to the null logger, a pointer to the print logger. If you remember back, uh, print logger is a struct, right? So you can have fields in there. So this would be a pointer to those fields. The second thing in the trait object is a pointer to a virtual function table, a V table. So now the things I'm telling you here, I need to call out, are, these are compiler implementation details. So they can change, they're not guaranteed, but it'll give you a general idea of what things look from a performance perspective. So here's a diagram showing what trait objects look like in memory. So on, on the far left here, we have the trait object, the reference to logger, and then we have the pointer to the struct, as I mentioned, and this is a pointer to this specific file logger instance. The second pointer is a pointer to the file logger V table. And the V table, you only have one V table for the, for the type, right? So you, if you have multiple file loggers, you still point to the same V table because the V table is just information about the file logger type. So you have some metadata in there, which is like the size of the type and stuff like that. Uh, but more importantly, you have this sequence of function pointers. You have pointers to implementations of each method for the logger trait. So you have a pointer to an error method, you have a pointer to a warn method, et cetera. Okay, so now how does a method call actually work? So we have this code that calls logger.info, but again, we don't know what type of logger it is at compile time. So how is this implemented? Well, it's really just two steps. So basically the first step is you just look up the function address for the uh, method implementation, and you get that from the V table, and then you just call it to that function address, you jump to it. So that's pretty straightforward. And you might ask, well, is this slow? And really the answer is it's not really that slow. It's just pretty fast, um, especially with memory caches. And CPUs are pretty smart these days. They can actually predict what the, uh, the jump address will be ahead of time before you actually figure out what it is. So that's kind of cool. But there's a bigger issue with this that does impact performance that you should probably be aware of. And the issue is that when you use a trait object, you're preventing the compiler from doing some optimizations. So let's say we have this, this code again, a uh, log example, and let's say that we know that most of the time the logger value, the, the logger parameter is going to be a null logger. So it's a, it's a logger object that does nothing at all. So we know that logger.info does nothing. It should be possible to remove that completely. The compiler should be able to optimize that away. The problem is the compiler doesn't know that it's going to be a lo null logger. It has to just write this, it has to produce this function that is that just works with any type of logger. So the solution to that, Rust has a solution to that. <laughs> the solution to that is generics. So, so far we've been talking about trait objects, which is the, the first line up here, where we just have a reference to a logger. But with generics, what we do is we write sort of like a template for the function, essentially. So in the second example, we have a generic type parameter, L. And this is saying that when you use this function, you must provide a type. You must provide a null, a null logger type or a print logger as a type, and then L, we were saying, where L logger, so we're saying that L must implement the logger trait. So now we can use L in our function and it will just fill in whatever the type actually turns out to be. So the way this works when it's compiled is that when the compiler compiles this generic function, it will produce multiple copies of this function, one copy for each logger type. So if you use this function with a print logger, then it will produce a copy for log example print logger. Or if you use this function with a null logger, then it'll produce a copy of this function for null logger. So you end up with this one function template being used multiple times to produce multiple copies of the same function. And this is useful because it means that the, the, the compiler can actually do these optimizations specifically for the type. It can look at what the type is and then do additional optimizations based on that. So here's a little example of how that would work. So I've got this, this kind of dumb implementation of a Fibonacci a function, right? So and the only differences between these two functions here on the screen is what's in the boxes. So on the right, I've added just one little logging statement, right? Logger.debug. And of course, this is inside the for loop, so that's really bad for performance because you wouldn't want to do logging 
in a tight loop like, like that. So, but what I did was I made this generic, because I'm not using a trade object here, I'm using generics. So when we pass in a logger object, or a, a logger instance, then we can make that whatever type we want. Let's say we made it a null logger. So if we pass in a null logger, then in theory, we should be able to completely eliminate this debug statement, right? Because the debug statement does nothing. Logger.debug is just an empty function. So hopefully the compiler is smart enough to do that. And it turns out that, yeah, it is. So if we pass in a null logger to this generic function, then it's able to completely eliminate the logger.debug statement. And we just end up, it turns out that the code on the left is the exact same as the code on the right in terms of what it's actually compiled to. All right, so that's sort of a, an overview of like generics versus trait objects. These are two different ways of using traits. Um, and there's really, there are really some trade-offs here. One's not clearly better than the other in, in all cases. So it, with generics, you're creating one copy of the function for each type that you use that function with. And trait objects, you're just creating one copy of the function that works with all types. So the advantage with producing multiple copies is that you can do optimizations specific to that one type. The disadvantage is that, of course, you're producing a lot more code, so you get longer compile times, which is an issue in Rust sometimes, and you also get larger executables, potentially. So there, there are trade-offs here, right? Trade, trade objects sometimes are, have a little bit more overhead, but maybe they ge generate less code, and that could actually be faster in some cases. So pros and cons. All right, that's basically all I got to say. So if you're interested in cryptography stuff, I blog about cryptography on uh, chosenplaindex.ca. Also, I'm on Twitter, McLean Zero. So if you have any questions, happy to answer those. Come find me later after Chorus Talk or uh, tweet me on Twitter. So that's, that's fine. So thanks for listening.